Good evening and welcome to this evening's NAPIT Trade Association webinar on the all new version of the EICR Code Breakers book. I'm Matt Freeman and we're joined tonight by Richard Townsend, NAPIT's Technical Development Engineer and Paul Chaffers, our Technical Events Manager, to take you through some of the new features of the brand new edition of Code Breakers updated for the 18th edition. So this evening, they'll take you through some of the new sections that have been put in this new edition of the book and tell you how you can use that book to code things you find when carrying out reports. There'll be some interactive parts to the session as well towards the end, where we'll give you the chance to let us know how you'd code certain situations based on the photos that Richard and Paul were showing you. To get involved at that point, there's a poll section in the top right hand corner of your screen now where it says polls. Later on, I'll be making those polls live for just 30 seconds at a time. So you can uh, put down there what you think each image should be coded as. And we'll see what Richard and Paul suggest after that. Towards the end of tonight's session, there will be a chance for you to ask any questions you have as well. You can jot them down anytime in the top right hand corner of your screen. You'll see just below the polls section, there's a questions tab. Type your questions into there and we'll get through as many of those as we can towards the end of this evening's session. But for now, I'll hand you over for the start of the presentation to Richard and to Paul. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Richard. This is Paul. Uh, we're now going to take you through the. I can't see the slides. That's it. Where are the slides? Cross that off. Cross where you are. No, where you are. Okay. That's it. Ah, there you go. Bit of technology for you. <laughs> okay, so we're now going to walk, work through uh, our new uh, code breaker. All new for the 18th edition. It's finally here. Did an awful lot of hard work to get it ready. Uh, it's all new for the 18th completely compliant, we published it on the 31st of October, launched it for the Sandal Alex last week. Uh, it complies with 7671 2018, uh, and it's completely new. Uh, when I say new, how new is new? Well, we've got 640 observations and codes. That's up from about 280 on the previous edition. Uh, we now include uh, information on part seven of BS7671, which is completely new for this because we didn't cover that in the last one, but we've now included all of the part sevens where they're relevant. Uh, part five, we've got five new parts to the guide itself. So not just observations and codes, we've got five complete new parts covering uh, risk assessments for the emission of an RCD, a whole section on it. We've got a whole section on frequencies of next inspections. We've got a whole section, a whole part on information for clients. We've got a whole new part on information for inspectors. And we've got a whole new part on no non codable observations. So the book now uh, is a fair chunk. We've gone up from 37 pages to 177 pages, almost quadrupled. It is a big document, all encompassing, and we're really, really proud and super stoked to get it out there. Uh, so, what did we do with it this time? What have we involved? Well, we've got 14 cooperating organisations. So it's not just NAPIT's internal team that put this together. We have got Hager, Mega, Electrical Safety Roundtable. We've got the GSH guys from Tresham College. We've got E5 guys. We've got City and Guilds. We've got Dane. We've got Surge Protection, Gambica, First Arc. All of these major organisations that have helped us to develop and make this document, this guide, this book, the best that it can be. But we didn't stop there. We thought best if we used cooperating individuals. Well, what's one of them you say? Well, people that are live and current in the industry actually doing this kind of work. They commented on it and they have given us massive amounts of information. Uh, and of that, we have, we had 10 JPL64 national committee members help us put this guide together and help us make sure that the information we were putting out was as accurate as it could possibly be. Two deputy BSI JPL committee chairmen, so chairman of the National National Committee. We have the Electrical Safety Roundtable Subgroup Housing Committee Chairman give us information. We have three social housing specialists. We had an NHBC Senior Technical Officer give us information. Three UK International Standards Committee's Electrotechnical Experts give us information. Four of the best training specialists in the UK and the GSH and Tresham guys. What amazing work they do. 15 members of them, 15 of them were members of the IAT. Four of those were fellows of the IAT. We have two sitting guilds, electrotechnical chief examiners, and of course our NAPIC technical team. So the amount of work and the amount of expertise that has gone into the new code breaker is truly astounding. 
Anyway, enough of that. I'm going to give you a little insight onto what we've done, and I'm going to let Paul explain uh, part two, the risk assessment, the emission of an RCD. Oh, thanks, Richard. Well, let's start by looking at the regulation. 411.33 allows emission of an RCD um, if an appropriate risk assessment is carried out. It should be noted that that's for anything other than a dwelling. So where we have a dwelling, any socket outlet requires 30 milliamp RCD. There's no question. We can't even have a specific label anymore in the 18th edition. So for dwellings, we need 30 milliamp RCD. But for other than a dwelling, a risk assessment carried out. It needs to be done um, with the client. The client has to take responsibility for that risk assessment. Um, the building could change its use over the years and the client needs to be aware that that risk assessment may need updating. How does all this fit in for the inspector? Well, if you go along to do a condition report and you're looking at a socket out there that hasn't got RCD, you've got to decide on what to code it. And that needs to be looked at in accordance with the risk assessment. Now, the first question is going to be to the duty holder, is there a risk assessment in place? And hopefully there is, and you can decide where it's appropriate and you can give the appropriate codes. But if it's not in place, we need to look at how can we help them complete the risk assessment. So the code breaker has got this all laid down. It's all sound advice. It's all given in the new code breaker. We've also provided model forms for you to use. Um, those model forms can be used for other risk assessments. Um, I think we've got an image here. Okay, so this is sort of what the forms look like. There's a lot of forms like this in the code breaker, all useful templates that can be used. Completely new and completely industry changing and groundbreaking, we have got a frequency of next inspection section. It gives you advice on how to risk assess your frequency of next inspection, should you wish to do that. We've also got our version of a table of next frequencies. We've taken, we're calling it um, our sliding semi-risk based structure. So basically what we've done there, uh, we've taken um, a, an installation and we have taken account of the maintenance on there, the DIY, the usage, um, and all the different installation types and we've given a sliding scale of frequency and it's either low, medium or high and you can see that's looked up there so green, good, good to go, it's a low risk so you've got for that particular installation there of caravan parks you've got three to five years, medium it's not quite so good there's some issues, history of damage they've not been put right so let's reduce that frequency uh, and we go to one to two years then we've got a high risk. So there's some lots going on, some damage, history of neglect. We need to make sure that we're looking at that more frequent, six to 12 months. So you can see a sliding scale now uh, that the inspector can give uh, to a frequency rather than stuck with the old industries, you must do this and you must do this with no way of movement whatsoever. So moving on from that, we've also got part four information for clients, specific to clients. And I'll just hand over to Paul, the special one, and he'll take you through that. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Yeah, now when clients look at these um, EICRs, they may be well experienced and be able to understand the codes, but not always. And sometimes they may be feeling a little bit lost. So what the code breaker does, it gives a massive amount of sound advice to help clients understand that EICR process. So, for example, you may have a landlord that's got a number of properties and he's getting EICRs and he doesn't know how accurate they are. And he can understand from this process of looking at the code breaker, not only what the recommended code should be, he can look at this advice in part four of the book to say, well, what is a limitation? How does that work? What do I do if I find that there is damage to um, the supplier's equipment, the meter operator's equipment? Is there a reporting process for that? So we've got all that in place. Um, social housing is a very specialist area. So there's sound advice on that in the, in the uh, new edition of the Code Breaker. Um, there's a dedicated section for um, items that they feel is also very important. There's a, a new model form for routine operation, operational visual inspections. Um, it's specifically designed for this sector. 
So here we are, we've got an image of the form there. So this allows for these visual inspections to be carried out in between the ICRs to be able to see if there's any obvious damage, um, if there's anything that they need to be aware of. It's all covered in these forms. Okay, hand back to Richard for part five. Absolutely. Part five, as important as the clients, we also need a part five, which we've now got, which is in information for inspectors, because inspectors need to know a vast amount of information. So they need to know about art fault detection. They need to know about surge protective devices, RCD characteristics and sensitivities, because as easy equipment to use, certainly the new surge and the art fault detection devices, inspectors need to know what they're looking for when they find them on a condition report or a period carrying out a periodic inspection. We also cover uh, what to do if you suspect asbestos is present. It's really important for an inspector to understand the dangers associated with asbestos. So we now cover that in great detail. We cover what you should do if you find it, uh, how you should protect yourself, how you should dispose of that asbestos. So if you take down an old consuming unit, an old fuse board, and you've got the flash hiders in there, there's a specific way you should do that and how you must dispose of it. All asbestos equipment that's removed must be disposed of correctly in the correct manner in a registered dump. You can't just chuck it in a skip and go down your landfill. It doesn't work like that. So to help us out, uh, we've also got the HSC uh, approved table of what to do when you find asbestos. And please, please, please take notice of it. Keep yourself safe. Other information for inspectors. We need to know what ZS values are, insulation reference method, all of these things. Uh, there's advice for ring, radial final circuits, what you can and can't alter, why you alter them, what the configurations are of them. There's masses of information, ideal for the inspector. It's just what you need when you're walking around. And now we're going to move on to part six, non-codable observations, because as much as we code things, there are things that we can't code, but we still have to talk about. Them. Okay, thanks Richard. Yeah, it's, um, it's always been a bit of a tricky one, this. Um, most inspectors have good knowledge of other areas within a building. It could be good knowledge on building regulations, good knowledge of emergency lighting or fire alarms, for example. And the issue with this is when we do a condition report, it's coded against BS 7671, whereas emergency lighting is 5266, um, fire alarms is BS 5839. So we don't necessarily need to code any defects that we see in accordance with those standards, or do we? So we just ask, um, Richard, what our options are. We've got some options given to us. We cover it in no break up. There are some options available to us. We A, we do nothing. We don't note it down because it's nothing to do with 7671. We ask our client uh, what we should do, which will be part of a limitation. We could we could give an option to our client um, that, that the equipment that I found that I feel uh, contravenes another uh, British standard and a specific inspection routine needs to be carried out for that. Smoke detectors damaged, emergency light not working, any of those things. So we give some options to our client of what to do, rather than think, oh, I don't know what to do, it's on 7671 inspection, um, but it's fire alarms, what do I do, what do I do? We give you that advice, we help you out. So it's covered. That's excellent, Richard, thanks. We've got there um, socket outlets from sinks and hobs. That's another one where we quite often see on reports, the socket outlet is within 300, millimetres of the sink, but that's not covered in BS 7671. So what's the code breaker done about that? Well, socket outs and sinks and holes are constantly debated. They have lots of problems. Uh, we've taken the guidance, the all new guidance from the NHBC, and uh, you see it popped up there. It differs from the industry norm. The NHBC have uh, spearheaded a new, a new way of looking at these things. It's taken up by industry now. It may not be in all the guidance out there, but we, we're sure we're the first. Uh, so the NHBC have stated, as you can see, uh, the drainer is gone from the, what they call, we're gonna call um, the sink. Uh, we've got that there. The drainer has now been removed. It's not seen as a necessary item. Lots and lots of new builds now, they have a standalone sink, they don't have a drainer, so it's gone. So the 300 mil distance is now from the vertical pane of the sink or the basin, we'll call it the basin. Uh, we don't take into consideration the flange or the mounting point of the, uh, of the sink in that elevational chart there. It's the inside uh, vertical pane. 
But again, it's a non-codable. Absolutely non-codable. These are industry engineering judgment distances, uh, which we feel uh, are, are relevant. It's not about what we can plug in and get stuck in a sink or plug in a put near a hob. Uh, what we're looking at are the thermal and uh, external, is uh, external environmental issues that can affect a socket. That's what we're looking for. Uh, it's almost not irrelevant that you can plug something in and drop it into a sink, because I could plug it into an extension leak and dump it into a sink. So when we're looking at sockets from sinks and sockets from hogs, we're looking at the water damage and splash damage, which is minimal, and we're looking at the heat damage and thermal damage. So we've reduced all of those uh, figures, we've reduced those distances down and we've taken out the drainer. So just to be clear then, if I'm looking at that socket that's next to the hob there and there is thermal damage to it, it's absolutely a codable item. Absolutely. We generally find if we're looking at something that's thermally damaged, we're always going to code it. We're probably going to code it C2 because anything that's thermally damaged means something's going to go wrong at some point. If it's thermally damaged, it's, it's cause for concern. Okay. Excellent. Well, what else have we got then? Well, so the new EICR code breaker for the 18th and edition and beyond. So what are we going to do? Well, it'll continue to evolve. As new ideas, new ways of inspection and test uh, come about, we're going to include them. Uh, we're going to adapt to new techniques, new equipment, new machines, uh, any kind of new test equipment out there or new ways of doing things, new ways of working. We're going to incorporate them into uh, the new code breaker. It's going to continue to evolve and include new and useful information. It will always provide, or we hope it will always provide, up-to-date compliance knowledge for both the client and the inspector. So that's a brief overview of the new code breaker. So now for the fun part, we're going to go into the uh, part where we just talk through how it actually works and we're going to go through to the interactive section. So how does the core part of the ICR code breakers work, the actual, uh, the actual part of its DNA? Well, we've got a section, where the, we have an observation based on either PS7671, as you can see up there, uh, and there'll be an ESQCR infringement or a BS7671 infringement. We'll give you the regulation number. And we'll give a suggested defect code, and that's basically how it works. Bearing that in mind, Paul's just going to go through now uh, what the codes are, and then we're going to crack on with some interactive stuff. Okay. We're going to take some pictures, uh, and we're going to ask for your view on them. Okay, I think it's important that Richard said there it's a suggested code. Absolutely. You guys are the inspectors. At the end of the day, if you see something on site that makes you feel that you need to give a slightly more serious or stiffer code, or you want to relax it slightly, that's your decision. But this is nine times out of ten the likely code you would use. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to just have a refresher of what the codes are. So we have the C1. And that's where there's danger present. So that could be a socket outlet is smashed open and there's access to live parts. So there's a risk of injury and therefore immediate remedial action is required. Now, if you find a C1, you can't just finish your report and issue the report sometime later because an accident could happen in the meantime. So when there's a C1 for your health and safety and for everybody around you, you need to report it to the client, to the duty holder, and there's different ways of doing it. One way that we would suggest at NAPIT is that you issue with a dangerous situation report to, so it's documented that you've passed that duty of care over. Now, at the beginning of the inspection, you may have agreed with your client what you're going to do in such an instance. They may give you permission to get on and fix a C1, but not always. So you need to make sure you've got access to somebody you can ask and somebody that you can pass that dangerous situation over to. So next up, we have a C2. So C2 is potentially dangerous. It still needs urgent remedial action, but you don't necessarily need to stop and give a dangerous situation report. So what this could be this time is it could be a crack socket. It's okay all the time it's together, but it's got that potential of falling apart and having access to live parts. So this therefore is potentially dangerous as a C2. Next up, we have a C3. This is improvement recommended. So you may see from the the traffic light system, what we've got there is you've got the danger present as the red and you've got the potential um, da potential dangerous as the amber. And now we've got the green. All of that saying is for the one and the two, it's an unsatisfactory report. But for a C3, the report could go through as satisfactory, but it's where you would just generally be making a recommendation that would generally improve the overall safety of the property. And then lastly, we have the FI 
further investigation without delay. Now, this is for a, a situation where you can't quite decide whether there could be an issue or not, and it needs that further investigation. So an example may be a distribution board, it's got circuit that's energized with a cable leaving it, but there's no label. And you can't just switch it off. It could be feeding a critical circuit. So you need that further investigation to find, is it a healthy circuit, in which case there's not a problem, or is it actually something dangerous, like a cable with a bare end hanging above the ceiling? So that's what the FI would be used for. So next up, we're going to look at these images. And I think Matt's going to tell you how you can put your, um, yeah, your code in it. Yeah, and I think uh, you're going to talk us through this one. While these guys, if you could start coding what you think that code would be. So you found that and how you would code it. Paul's just going to go through a few pointers as you're going through. Okay, yeah. So it's a light in junction box with heat damage. I think we'd all agree that junction box is um, fit for purpose. It's the type of uh, junction box you would use um, for a down light. You can see that the heat is most likely um, being caused by junction box resting on a, a down light, probably a halogen down light. You can see the plaster of the ceiling has got the heat marks on it, which we're all familiar with from those old halogen down lights. Now, item 5.18 of the ICR asks us to look at the condition of accessories, including joint boxes. So as much as the customer is not going to like us pulling their fittings down, we do need to do it. We do need to look at a sample to see what their conditions are. So you've had um, sort of a bit of time now to enter your codes. Um, I think we're going to reveal let's, what... Let's see if we can, uh, I don't know whether Matt can let us know. Uh, what kind of, uh, what was the most um, prevalent code, if we can ask Matt? Yeah, now, uh, thanks to the joys of technology, when the poll starts, you will have all noticed, if you're watching, that the uh, presentation disappears. So for the next one, we'll give you a chance to uh, take a look at the picture and discuss it while Richard and Paul are uh, going through exactly what's going on. And then we'll give you 30 seconds following that to pop mm -hmm. your code in. But for those of you with a very good memory who uh, still managed to put your uh, code and observations in when the picture had disappeared, 57% of those said it would be a C1 with 40% saying C2 and 4% saying FI. So the most popular one for the first one was C1. Okay, let's see what the um, let's see what the code breaker would say. It's saying it's an FI. Um, the reason being is that for a C1 it would have to be danger present. The, the, the junction box is still quite intact. There's no access to live parts and we can actually undo that screw to look inside and check that the the wiring is not a, a real issue. So that would move us towards a C2 of having that potential danger. So well done to anybody who said a C2. But the reason why we're saying an FI is because usually when you have downlights, you have a lot of them. So we found this at the first one we've looked at. What we've got to do now is look at quite a few of the others to check that this is not a current theme and that this is a one-off. So we need further investigation to find out that all the other lights have been installed correctly, and this will give you justification for issuing an FI. Okay, so we'll move on. Uh, and we've now got, uh, if you can start your voting process, we have a distribution board uh, full of different MCBs and circuit breakers and bits and pieces. We've got a surge protective device there. Uh, so what would you code that as just looking at it? As we're going through it, I'll just point out, we've got banking plates missing. So we've got IP2X infringement. Uh, you can see the DIN rail there uh, with quite a wide gap. So it's quite possible you're going to be able to get your hand in there and touch a buzz bar. Uh, mixed equipment types, poorly fitting, access to live parts. Uh, so we'll just give you a, a few more seconds to... Uh, um, the poll's just been open. So the poll's just been open. So we've got 30 seconds from there. Um, so if you could give us your view on that, how do you code that? So Matt, can you tell us uh, how we went with that one? Yeah, fairly similar picture to last time in the end, really. We had 3% this time saying it was a C3, 22% who'd code it as a C2, but uh, way out in front, 75% of those who responded would code that one as a C1. Uh, absolutely right. You've got access to the live parts. If I can see it, I can touch it. It's going to kill me now. That's going to be a C1. 
Um, well, it's, it's interesting, we can see where some of the guys are coming from, from the C2 actually. If this were, say, locked in a uh, power room or a plant room and there was no access uh, other than by a, 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 t a key or a tool, or you got, uh, it was under the, the um, instruction of a skilled person electrically, you might, might be able to lax it to a C2, but I'd be very, very against it. You've got a consumer unit, a distribution board, you've got access to live parts, so we'd be very much looking at a C1 for that, I believe. So, thanks for that. All right, now we're going to move on to the next one, hand it over to Paul, and we'll do the next, uh, the next interactive picture. Okay, what we've got here is, uh, we've got a meter cabinet. Um, we look inside it, you can just about see an extension deed there. that has been connected directly into the um, credit meter and into the PME cutout. There's no overcurrent protection for that um, extension lead because it's uh, the plug's been cut off and the sheath's been um, stripped back to make the connection. So therefore, we've got um, access to basic insulation, single insulation, and there's no RCD additional protection for the socket outlets that are there. So meter seals have been broken. Um, to allow that connection. Now they have connected on the load side of the meter, so they've got a conscience, they're paying for the electricity, but there is this issue of cutting the sills, creates further issues. Um, so what we're gonna code that as, let's see what, see what the guys say. So most popular one this time, it was 32% for the C1, but 60% for the C2, with just a few saying C3 or FI. So C2 was the most popular one there. Excellent. Let's see what the uh, code writer says. Yeah, C2. It's not got um, it's not got any danger present as it just sits there in its box, but it's got all those potentials for danger. Remember, I said it's connected into a PME. Somebody could put their caravan plugged into this extension lead. Um, therefore, uh, PME systems are um, you know forbid for connection to a caravan, or they could use a piece of equipment outside and, and have an accident and there's no RCD protection. So it's got all those potentials for dangers and that's why it's a, a C2 code. Rightio, and we'll move on to our next one. So the socket's completely smashed if, we, if we're honest. We've got IP rating compromised, possible access to live parts, uh, the live pin on the right hand side showing signs of burning and heat and thermal damage. Obviously something's been plugged into it and taken a fair amount of load. But in general, the big issue is the socket that is smashed and we've got access to live parts. Okay, so um, plenty of results in and pretty much all but unanimous really. Just 3% saying a C2, but 97% saying a C1 on this one. Yeah, absolutely. We'll just take a quick look. Uh, Let's take a quick look. We've got a problem with the... Uh... Yeah. We are now looking at a C1. Yeah, absolutely. We've got access to live parts. Uh, if you put a finger, a probe, or a prod, or something can go in there, so it's very, very dangerous. There's an immediate danger to C1. You can see it, I can touch it, it'll kill me now. So now we're going to get to the interesting part of the, uh, this is more of an observational thing. So what we've got a picture of there, if you'd like to start having a think about it, we've got a consumer unit there, it's got blocked in, been, it's been boxed in, you can see a wooden access door there. We've got some cables kind of hanging down a little bit. Uh, we've got uh, a meter there with uh, some tight terminals, tight cables on it, packed in an earth, not supported adequately. Consumer unit's not really accessible for maintenance. I can drop the uh, front access panel down, I can remake circuit breakers, but I can't actually access um, the inside of consumer unit to do any maintenance work. So how would you code, code that? How are you guys going to code that? 30 seconds just up there, 16% uh, this time saying a C2, 20% saying an FI, but 65% saying C3 on that one. Yeah, you see, if you'd have given it a C3, let's see if you guys are going to change your mind. This is an observation, it's more about perspective. So instead of giving you the code, we're going to let you look at this in a slightly different take. How are you going to code it now? So. We've gone from standard fitment, we've now actually had the whole lot literally taken off the wall and put into the ceiling. Uh, so the contractor or the builder has knocked down the wall, he's removed those items off the wall and put them into the ceiling. 
Now, we all know if we're going to have a meter and we're going to have a consumer unit, we're going to have a cutout. We're going to have a, a, we're going to have a cutout, a, a fuse, we're going to have something. We're going to have a supplies cutout fuse. Can't see that. That's been boarded and boxed in. So, that taken into consideration, what do you think now? Back to a nurse, not supported adequately. Consumer unit may not be accessible for maintenance. It's quite a high ceiling, that one. Um, we've got front door being uh, blocked in almost by that that wooden five foot access panel. How are you going to code that now? So if uh, Matt can start the poll and we can see where we go. Well, we don't have time for the additional poll on that one, but I'm sure Richard and Paul, that would probably move things away from a C3 into something uh, much more severe. Yeah, it's an FI and a C2. It's always going to be a C2 because there's some serious issues going on there. It's also going to be an FI simply because we don't know if the DNO is going to allow their equipment to be moved in that orientation. They might say that they want to put it back in, in the right orientation. Also, accessories and consumer units are not designed to be in that sort of plane. They're not supposed to be bolted to the ceiling. You've got all sorts of issues with cooling. Uh, they're designed to be horizontal and on a wall. Um, so the heat generally comes up through the consumer unit and at the top and naturally cools them. If you put them on a ceiling like that, then the heat's just going to bounce back and possibly damage the circuit breakers or any accessories inside that enclosure. And you're not going to be able to see that and you're not going to be able to access it to see it. Also, it could be a big hole in the back of that consumer unit where the cables have actually come in, the wires have come in. Uh, that means now all that heat's going to go straight out of that hole and straight into the room above. So there's a possible fire hazard in building uh, regulations infringement as well. You've also got the, pro the same problem with that smart meter. So the smart meter could do with being possibly moved. So for us, certainly going to be a C2. All day long it's a C2, but also it's an F5. We don't quite know how that one's going to go on. Uh, it is a current uh, inspection, about a year old, I think, that one. Um, so we're, we're going to keep away from that and just work out what happens. We'll probably keep you informed and let you know. But for the time being and for this uh, interactive session, we're FI and C2 on that. So, oops, thanks for watching. If you want a copy of Code Breaker, it's available on our Naked Direct website for a non-member price, $19.99, member price, $17.99. Having some technical difficulties. Also, if you want to follow NAPIT on social media, you know, there's our Facebook, our Twitter, and our LinkedIn uh, signs and our addresses. Please feel free to add us and just follow and see what we're doing. We put all sorts of information up there, what we're doing, where we're going, where we've been. Uh, and if, you, uh, if you're lucky, we might even get back to you and answer a few questions. Uh, we often get on there and we often give our advice to people. So uh, thank you for watching this interactive session. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties and the fact that I don't know how to use the wheel mouse very well. Uh, uh, if you've got any questions, if you'd like to put them to Matthew in some way and type it on your screen, and we'll endeavour to answer those questions. So, Matthew, have we got thank any questions? You to, thank you to Richard. Thank you to Paul as well. If you do want to pop some questions in, in the next 15 minutes or so, you'll see you've got the questions tab in the top right hand corner of your screen. You can type your question in there. We'll get through as many of them as we can in the next 15 minutes or so. Starting with this one, are the, uh, the model risk assessment forms that we were speaking about earlier, are they available to download? They are not available yet because the book is just so new. However, we will be making them uh, available on the members site. It's a free download so that you can use them, uh, modify them, put your own logos on. So yes, at some point in time, they are going to be available to you. It's quite possible we'll have them ready for January for when the... Absolutely. When, They're when, certainly going to be ready for January, I feel. Yeah, when the book comes into force, we, uh, we'll have them ready. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, a couple of questions coming in asking about who can carry out EICRs and, and how do you assess who can do EICRs? Uh, legally, anybody can carry out an EICR. Uh, from our perspective, uh, we would like to see quite a lot of experience and some significant qualifications, I think. EICRs is very, very tricky. Uh, you, you're required to have far more uh, knowledge of existing installations uh, than just basic installation. I say basic. Uh, if you're going to install a, a system from new and design it, that's okay. Uh, there's no problem there, but when you're going to do a condition report, you've almost got to have uh, an ongoing knowledge and a historic knowledge of previous methods so you can understand why they were put in that way, 
so you can then um, take a look at them and compare them with what's new. Uh, Paul's one of our is a, is a experiencing that from Napier. He's, he's now in his new role, but he was uh, an inspections manager for the South East. So maybe he can give us some advice on yeah, the kind of things he's looking for uh, if you're going to go and do an ICR and what type of qualifications we'd be looking at from a Navy perspective. Yeah, sure, Richard, no problem. Yeah, I haven't spent almost a decade in Navy inspections. It, it gives me um, quite you know, a, a good standing to be able to talk about this. Yeah, mo I mean, most of our members have got the qualifications anyway because we've always looked for that test and inspection qualification. But it's typically a level three qualifications such as a 2391 in all money and then it was 2395 for the periodic aspects of, of the testing qualification. Um, but Richard hit the nail on the head, it's experience. What we're looking for is members with the experience to do it. Now if they wish to do it, it's not a problem. As part of the assessment, we will assess by looking at a sample number of EICRs and checking the accuracy of those codes um, and having a good, good conversation with them. If they only do test and inspection, then it's quite uh, stands to reason the actual assessment will be on the site looking at a periodic inspection. Absolutely. Um, if they do um, all manner of works, then we're there. So we're, yeah. one year we may look at a couple of installations and another time we look at test and inspection. But it is assessed against the um, requirements for doing an EICR and of course they've got to have the relevant insurance in place which is professional indemnity for doing that type of work which we can provide through NAPIT insurance um, at no problem but it all comes down to that experience and that understanding because you are there at the day you're making the judgment on the installation and you've got to get it right so we don't let anybody do it they've got to have those higher levels of experience they've got to have the insurance in place they've got to have the um, the correct qualifications and so on. Now, providing all that's in place and they're competent, they can be listed um, up for, on the neighbor's site, you can search and you can tailor your search for somebody doing an inspection. You can even tailor it, whether it's a commercial inspection mm -hmm. or a domestic or an industrial, and that can all be searched for. So they're only they're only listed under those bits if they've been assessed for those, those bits. What's absolutely key, it's not about the qualification. Competence is not a qualification. Confidence is experience. So when we look at confidence, we're also looking at experience. Uh, I think that's the best way we can answer that. Um, so Matthew, next question, please. Okay, uh, this question is more to do with sort of time between EICRs. Uh, what, what if an RCD fails between EICRs? Who has stated that that RCD will fail safe? Uh, if an RCD fails in between, uh, I don't know how you're going to know because obviously you've got to do some kind of um, periodic on it. Well, I'm assuming, tells you. I'm assuming if it, if it became a problem became and somebody a... came back and said, mm -hmm. you've done my inspection two years ago, yeah. but my RCD's failed now. If it, in good faith you have given a frequency and a client comes back and says, well, my RCD's failed, uh, it's, a piece of a, it's a piece of equipment, it's an accessory. They fail. It's something that happens. Uh, you can't see into the future. You can only give your advice based around the guidance we've given you. That sliding risk assessment, if you wish to use it. Um, but we can't we can't take into consideration all of the possibilities. So if an RCD does go rogue and does does not work, um, there's not much we can do about it. From a failing safe perspective, uh, an RCD may fail safe. You need to speak to a manufacturer. By failing safe. We mean that it stopped working, but it stopped working in the off position. Uh, and I don't think all RCDs do that. I'm not sure. It no, depends how it's failed. But many of the RCD manufacturers will tell you that the actual test by um, is the key to the testing of the RCD. So if the client is advised to test their test buttons regularly, which is six monthly now in the 18th mm -hmm. edition, mm -hmm. that will help keep that RCD functional. Absolutely. The, uh, the test button in, in itself is really a manual or a mechanical function and what you're doing is basically freeing off uh, the, mechan the mechanical function of the RCD. So it's actually quite important to use that test button. It is and whilst um, you know BS7671 calls for a six monthly, there may be times when you would introduce it more frequently. I certainly know like marinas and places like so that with a salty environment suffer with RCDs failing. Yeah, so certainly swimming pools with the uh, the high temperatures and the humidity and the chlorine and the chemicals that you use in a swimming pool. RCDs are, it is actually quite common for them to start to break down and stop working. 
So it's really advantageous uh, in that kind of environment. Maybe give the button a push if possible, uh, if it's safe to do so, just to make sure that it's working properly, give you a good idea and a good heads up. Uh, so from that perspective, you'd need to look at the environment the RCD is placed in and maybe reduce your frequencies if that's the problem. Hopefully they've answered that, Matthew. Next question, okay. please. Okay. Uh, plenty of questions coming through about how to code particular things, including how would you code non-fire rated downlights in the first floor with a flat above? Uh, non-fire rated with a flat above? Well, first of all, it opens the question, is it a, a requirement of the BS 761 or is it a requirement of the building regulations? It's too? more of a building regulation, I think, we'll find. But we do, we do have things for ceiling fire barriers. So if it was deemed as a fire barrier, we do, the regs does cover ceiling. It does, it does cover that kind of thing. Uh, but for me, if it's a, a habitable room above, i.e. someone's going to be living in it or staying in it, then and there's no fire barrier in place, uh, then we'd probably be looking at a C2, possibly. If the uh, room above was not habitable, not lived in, it was a lost space for argument's sake, uh, and it wasn't a fire rated downlight, maybe looking at C3, you know, room for improvement there. Uh, but certainly if someone is above that non-fire rated fitting, um, then I think code breaker actually does cover it. I'm fairly certain it covers as a C2. Okay. Okay. Um, is it a requirement for a third floor flat to have an RCD on sockets? Uh, yes. yes, yes. The yes. new, the new requirement, new build, new build. Yes, a new build. The requirements are for socket outlets that are rated up to thirty-two amps. Absolutely. So the type of socket that is. That's not the size of circuit breaker. That's the type of socket. So in a in a domestic property, they're thirty amp yep. socket outlets. So up to any socket outlet up to thirty-two amps in a domestic dwelling requires RCD protection. But as Richard's alluded to, under the 16th edition, it was only really sockets that were used outside for portable equipment. So Absolutely. ground floor sockets or outside sockets. So you may be inspecting a property that was wired under 16th edition. And really and truthfully, there was never a requirement for a third floor flat to have an RCD. So therefore we'd probably give a C3 as you a, would, as you a would. Because, recommendation. Uh, because the regulations are respected, retrospective from, from, from that kind of issue. So if it was an existing third floor, third storey building, third floor flat, whatever you want to call it, uh, then maybe a C3. Uh, however, it has been known for people to dangle extension leads out the window to go and clean their cars, leave them out. Uh, if you're carrying out any ICR and you see that on the property that you're working on, then evidently they're using the non-RCD sockets to feed equipment outdoors, that would be a C2. But in general cases, if you just walked in there, it'd be a C3. Obviously, if it's been uh, installed, it's a new installation, it's installed to uh, um, any of the 17th editions, uh, then we'll be looking at RCD protection on those socket outlets. There you go, Matthew. Next question, please. Okay. Um, if you find you can't get an IR reading on a neutral or an earth, uh, would this be coded as a C2? Okay. You wouldn't get an IR. Uh, do you mean if, uh, I'm assuming if you if you've got a breakdown in the insulation and uh, the, the insulation resistance finds that there is a breakdown in the insulation, I'm guessing. You're guessing that's what the question is. I think is. that's what they're coming for. Uh, in which case, yes. And it would depend on what that breakdown of insulation resistance is, because obviously we've got minimums and maximums required, uh, depending on the voltage input, uh, various, various other bits and pieces. Um, if it was below, it's required minimum, then yes, we'd give it a C2. If it was a, only just above the minimum, um, but only just, but still okay, then possibly a C3, because we know something's going it's, on. It wasn't, it's a very tricky. It wasn't too much detail in the Not question. Not very so much detail, I'm really sorry, tr 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 bit tricky one to understand. We're guessing that the, uh, the person that's asked that question He's talking about what do I do if I've got uh, a low insulation resistance reading? Uh, uh, absolutely. And again, if it's a, a large property or an industrial or commercial, it yeah. may need an FI because you may need to look into yeah. what is dragging that, that yeah. problem down. Yeah. So, so you could go C2 or you could go FI or C3 if it's below what you'd expect, i.e. what that meter kicks out. But still 200, 300, 500. 
but that would be acceptable. Yeah, we, there, there are, there's so many ways of answering that without knowing too much, Matthew. So hopefully we've done the best we can. Okay, and uh, if you do have questions tonight and you'd like a little further detail, or if you'd like to ask a question in a little more depth, then you can email them into nta at napit.org.uk and we'll get you an answer as soon as we can. Time for uh, a couple more questions before we're done tonight. Uh, how do you code uh, places with old sort of Wilex consumer units as the new regs do state that RCD protection is required for all circuits in the 18th edition? Regulations are not retrospective. Uh, so that doesn't mean to say that because we've got Amendment 3 when it came out and we've got the 18th edition now that's going to be live in January, uh, it doesn't mean that older installations are any less safe. So provided the uh, installation has not got sockets being used outside, as we previously mentioned, there isn't any damage, uh, the, the covers are all on, um, there's nothing untoward, no smashed up sockets, um, and it's can safe for continued use is the key point. When you carry out an inspection, a condition report, you do any periodic inspections, you're looking to see if the installation is safe for continued use. And just because it was wired up to an older version of the regulations doesn't mean it's any less safe. However, you would mention on there, well, there's no RCDs for this, there's no RCDs for that, possibly a C3, you know, or more, it's likely to be a C3, requires improvement, or recommends improvement to bring it up possibly. Uh, if sockets are being used uh, externally to power up mobile equipment, that's going to escalate straight to a C2. Um, but then you're only looking at RCD protection on those given sockets. So, no, I wouldn't vilify an older installation just because it's got older boards. There are some other bits and pieces around that, because when you say a wireless board, do you mean the wooden back ones? Do you mean the old plastic type ones? This goes back to what we discussed earlier about the competence and the experience mm. because you could be looking at the bathroom stuff. Yes, yeah. there's no RCD there, so now we need to fall back on Absolutely. the requirements of supplementary modeling. So the inspector needs to have a wide knowledge of all of these different things. And you know, the, the NAPIT technical outline and the NAPIT forums and that can provide that knowledge. Absolutely. And, and back up, but that's the problem. It's not a. It's not a, oh, there's no RCD. There's one code. You've got to look at all the circumstances, as Richard really. said. What did what, what was the requirement for that in the 16th edition? Have we got supplementary bonding? Is there any socket out that's being Absolutely. used outside? So there's a whole manner of things that are in lots of things. So it, it's not a clear cut question. Uh, hopefully, we've answered that in an acceptable manner, Matthew. So we have the, probably one of the last questions, and then we'll. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll squeeze one more in before we're, before we're done this evening. So uh, this is a question for someone who's carried out an EICR on a property that uh, another electrician had said was satisfactory, even though there was no RCD on the socket circuit and shower circuit. He did make a comment about the installation not having an RCD, but with that in mind, should he have given it a satisfactory as he did? Again, uh, if we, if we think back to the previous question, if an installation was put together by a previous edition of the wine regulations that didn't call for uh, an RCD, it could well be satisfactory for continued use. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if a previous edition called, didn't call for RCDs, it may well have called for supplementary bonding. So both of those electricians, in both cases, if there's no RCD present, it could well be satisfactory. Nothing wrong with it. But you may need to look at whether the supplementary bonding is in place and look at some of the other things that are going on there. Yeah, the mention of the shower circuit concerns me because with the requirements of the regulations, we do have to take account of the manufacturer's instructions mm. and yep. most showers will call for an RCD to be fitted. So from an inspection point of view, you'd have to consider that as well, but which is quite right in what he said. If it's deemed to be safe for continued use, um, for the reasons just stated, then that's fine. The beauty of the code breaker is it helps with those sorts of decisions. We quite often get disputes where you've got one electrician saying it's a two and the other guy saying it's a three and the customer don't know who's right and who's wrong. They've got a book, um, an industry leading book that can say, when you have got that observation, it's that code there, then that can really help with that situation. Yeah, it's great when you go into a client and they say, why have you coded that? for this industry leading uh, document here that I'm using says I must do that or gives me that as a as a baseline so it could be very helpful absolutely uh, and hopefully that's helped everybody uh, I think we're all 
clear to questions now. We've got much more time left, Matthew. You have to tell us. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it for time this evening. Thank you very much for attending this evening. Thanks again to Richard and to Paul, and do enjoy the rest of your evening.